world, O oh God, that seems to be battling so many hot issues that they have no control over. Bless us to this end is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. O oh Malachi, tell me why. I should tell you that there are concerns by some etymologists. There are concerns about whether Malachi is a real person or a symbol of a particular character. Actually, the book of Malachi means my messenger. That is what Malachi means, my messenger. But whether or not the experts will continue to haggle over the issue, all right, it is clear that this message came in the 5th century, a hundred years after Cyrus declared, Dr. Gabriel, that the Jews should be set free. They should leave Babylon. They could go back to Jerusalem. They could rebuild the city. They could restore their laws. And they could be an independent, sovereign nation and no longer slaves to an international foreign power. So I want to make that very clear. Very, very clear tonight. When I talk about old Malachi, tell me why. Because Malachi is a last day prophet and the last prophet in the book of Revelation, in the Old Testament. So it's the last prophet there. All right, after him, you have Matthew, you have Mark, you have Luke and John. So my subject today is, in fact, my challenge is that I have to prove tonight, okay, the relevance of the message of Malachi and his use of Elijah as a metaphor. In other words, I have to prove tonight academically, biblically, that the message of Elijah is relevant and Malachi knew that as an authentic prophet. In other words, I have to tonight to seek to validate the message of Malachi. Why did he use Elijah? Why did he use uh, uh, Jeremiah? Why did he use Isaiah? They were absolutely fantastic prophets. They were in the stratosphere, the upper limits uh, of prophetic aristocracy. So why in heaven's name? Huh? That he used uh, Malach Malachi, he used Elijah. And, and, and we will get to that in a short while. This is a broken world. All right? Now let me tell you something. In the days of Malachi, get this carefully here. All right? When he gave his message, after the dedication of the second temple in Jerusalem in 516 BC. Now remember, we are talking about Cyrus in 538 BC overthrowing Babylon and then giving freedom and being the opposite. His attitude was opposite <laughs> to the attitude of Belshazzar. Belshazzar in Daniel chapter 5 takes the sacred vessels. I talked about that yesterday. He pours alcohol in them. He gives his, his, his cabinet functionaries. Uh, he gives to the women. He gives his outside women also. He gives his concubines. He gives his princes. All right? And he gives his princesses. Uh, the whole cabinet, the whole government structure is led in a blasphemous revolution in the days of Belshazzar. Cyrus, the anointed, I told you yesterday, the Meshach, is completely opposite to Belshazzar. He restores the sacred vessels. He puts them back in the temple. He restores them in the most holy place. He gives full respect to the Day of Atonement, the priesthood of Israel. He appreciates that. He's worshipping the sun and the moon. He's worshipping the sin god, but he respects the God of Israel. You know, when I check the life of Cyrus, I say hallelujah. I say amen. And I say amen because God has people in every church, in every race, in every class. God has his people. And at the right time, they will move out and identify with the remnant church of God. This is a broken world in absolute confusion. The ma there are three major factors about Malachi. The first major factor is that God is finding it impossible to get his covenant people to keep the covenant. In other words, they are fundamental, um, how should I say, it? intergenerational covenant breakers. They are breaking the covenants all the time. And yet God, though disappointed, does not abandon 
His people. I say praise God for that. And you and I should know that. We have sinned and sinned, and we have come short of the glory of God. The Greek word is hamartia, meaning, you know, missing the mark. We have missed the mark on several occasions, like the people of Israel in the Old Testament, in the New Testament. And yet God, though disappointed, does not abandon us. I thank God for God. Come on, my dear friends. I thank God for God. That is the God who he is. He sees his people breaking the covenant because a covenant is between two or more people and, and you agree to keep your end of the bargain. And the people of Israel are never keeping their end of the bargain. But God is always keeping his end of the bargain. And that was why we say that God is a trustworthy God. God is a reliable God. God can be trusted. Praise God for God. Now, the next thing about Malachi is this. There is an abandonment of a commodity called commitment. There's an abandonment of that. The people, watch this carefully here, they reject God and the things of God. They have seen the locusts invade the land, but they are resentful and indifferent towards God. Now, if I have to prove what Malachi is saying is true and the relevance of the Elijah message, all right? Not Elijah, but the message in the last days. We have to figure out in 2022 if people are indifferent to God in spite of COVID. You know, I see in Trinidad right now, the big focus is not on COVID. The big focus is on carnival next year. In other words, we have murders like that. We are racing towards 600. And yet the people of Trinidad and Tobago are concerned. I told one of the functionaries in Tobago to tell Farley Augustine, because I, I didn't have time to get on to him, do not have two carnivals in Tobago next year. You're a Seventh-day Adventist. Have mercy. And you want it to be recorded that Tobago broke record. And instead of having one carnival, it's now going to set a stage to have two carnivals. One with Trinidad and the other in October uh, uh, exclusively. I told them no. But you see, it's amazing that when the world needs God most, it turns its back on God. And that is significant. So that was in the days of Malachi, and that is in our day today. As it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, all right? And, and the same LGBT thing comes through in a big way, all right? Now watch this here. This is a broken world in absolute confusion. One thing with God, he could create confusion in the camp of the enemy. Because you would expect that this movement to ban, all right, trans-athletic girls, girls who are in fact boys, but went through some kind of transgender reassignment surgery. You would expect that to come out, uh, you know, the, 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 the push against it to come out from religion, to come out from the church, to come out from priests uh, and imams uh, and pundits. But no, three Connecticut high school girls are suing over a policy, all right, that allows, not arrows, but allows trans athletes to compete in swim sports because they, they are still men. And they have an advantage over the girls. And that is well known. This is Babylon. Total confusion. Even in the sporting world, there is total confusion. Pandemic and divorce rates. The stress of the pandemic has led to a jump on divorce rates in the developed world by 34%. That, that's a heavy figure. If it was 10%, it would be heavy. But this is 34%. We are living just as the time of Malachi forecasted about the relevance of the message of Elijah. Gay and lesbian marriage explosion in the world today. You see men kissing men and ladies kissing ladies. And, and, and you have one of the ladies dressing up as a man and the other dressing up as a woman. It's too much. It's, it's almost too much to bear. But this is, this, yeah, Brian, this, this, is, this is crazy. I mean, I see you all snickering and laughing. But this is totally crazy what is going on here. So that, what I am saying to you, that Malachi, all right, is relevant, and Elijah's message is relevant. 
Remember Elijah, not Elijah, John the Baptist, uh, who was called Elijah. They thought John the Baptist was an incarnation of Elijah. And Herod felt that way when John the Baptist told him, you can't be marrying your half-brother's wife. I have a divorce in your half-brother and you're marrying her. And it was an incestuous relationship there. It was a totally incestuous relationship there that was going on. So as it was then, so it is now. This world is not our home. And conditions in Elijah's time is equivalent uh, to the conditions we have now. And that is why I am saying that we are approaching the end of this world. Destruction awaits this planet. Folks, there is no way out of that. The global warming, to those online, the global warming tells us, all right, that's why they want to go to Mars and set up colonies outside there. Because like the Tower of Babel, they're trying to build their own tower. They're trying to build a technological tower. They're trying to get out of this planet because uh, islands are disappearing, global warming, the sea level rising, the ozone layer has a lot of holes in it, and the implications for skin cancer, for example, are heavy. This world is not our home. Hmm. So there's gay and lesbian marriage explosion in the world today. And that's where we have. But they have gone further. You have the call to legalize incest, where relatives can marry. So Revelation 14, 6 and 7 says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven. Now this angel here is a human being that is proclaiming the everlasting gospel. Uh, did I hear you say amen, brethren? It's a human being that is filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. So John says, it's under the angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them to dwell on the earth. Now watch this. Watch the conjunction and. And to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Hold a minute there, Brother Kumar. Hold a minute there. What you see here is the repeated conjunction. The repeated conjunction. You have the angel is flying in the midst of heaven with the everlasting gospel. It's everlasting because God is everlasting. It is everlasting because God is eternal. It is everlasting, my dear friends, because God, my dear friends, uh, cannot die. I, I want you to understand that. He is always eternal. He is unconditionally immortal. You know, Seventh-day Adventist was asking me as they read the lesson quarterly, Pastor, when will we get unconditional immortality? And I told him we will never get that. All right? We would never get that. Brother Kevon, we will never get that. <laughs> unconditional immortality is in the domain of divinity. God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. We are not <laughs> intrinsically everlasting, but the Word of God, the Gospel, the Evangelion, uh, is intrinsically everlasting. It is everlasting because the Gospel is about a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. It is everlasting because it's about a, 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 a being who is 100% God and 100% man. So I told him we will never, even in heaven, we, Dr. Gabriel, we will never be unconditionally mortal. Never, never. Only God the Father, not even the angels. Uh, are, are you hearing me, Pratringa? Not even the angels uh, are unconditionally immortal. Only God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Ghost. And I mentioned to you, that's why I told a terrorist in Trinidad who was opposed to me, a terrorist, uh, a killer, an assassin. He asked me, all right, he says... Uh, we, we should take, when he said we, he mean them, huh? we should take care of you. Because you are opposing our gospel, the Islamic gospel. And I told him to understand the Trinity. You have to understand there's eternity past and eternity future. Praise God. And God the Son was in eternity past and he stepped forward into time. So we human beings could step from time into eternity future. That is the awesomeness of the Godhead. And, and you know, it's the Seventh-day Adventist movement uh, that has the ability to explain and to clarify and to validate uh, what we talk about, the triune God, God the Father and God the Son uh, and God the Holy Ghost. Uh, and, and, and when we talk about the everlasting gospel, uh, we are talking about the gospel of God the Father and God the Son uh, and God the Holy Ghost. Uh, in the beginning was the Word, John chapter 1, uh, and the Word was with God uh, and God was with the Word. Uh, the same was in the beginning with God. And that's the Logos. 
the rep representation, uh, all right, the word of God, uh, the word made flesh uh, that dwells among us, uh, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Uh. Oh, there is power in the name of Jesus. Uh. There is hope in the name of Jesus. Every nation, and this is the additive and, add in, and what comes before the conjunction is different than what comes after the conjunction. So it is it, to dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Let's go to verse 7 saying, with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. Now that and give glory to him is not additive. It is explicative. Giving glory to him, that is God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Ghost, explains the meaning, defines the imperative sentence Fear God. You understood, second person, pronoun, you fear God. All of us, we have to fear God. That means we have to trust God. That means we have to give glory to Him for the hour, for the time, for the moment of His judgment is come. And worship Him that made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. So you see, my dear friends, the Sabbath is in there. Because the language of the fourth commandment is the language of the first angel's message. Fear God. He's the creator. Everywhere must hear the everlasting gospel. Fear God. He's our redeemer. Everywhere must get the everlasting gospel. All right? And, and, and you will worship him because he is the creator. Since he's our creator, it makes worshiping of God imperative. All right? Did I hear you say amen, brethren? It makes the worship of God imperative. It is not optional. I tell some of my big shot friends in the political world and the business world, you think worship is optional, but you can't go to heaven unless you worship God. You cannot go to heaven unless you obey His commandments. You cannot go to heaven unless you love God. And you cannot go to heaven unless you surrender to God. And it's amazing to them. I told them that worship is not, is not optional. It is imperative. Did I hear you say amen, brethren? Let, let's move on quickly. This is the hour of judgment. You see what the clock says there? One minute to midnight. Lord have mercy. I don't know about you, but if you agree with me, I'm going to make a statement, and you'll say a loud amen if you agree with me. This planet is running out of time. Could I say that again, brethren? This planet is running out of time. I mean, all the experts in the world, the Antonio Gutierrez, I talked enough about him yesterday and the night before. But I'm saying this planet is running out of time. They can't control the global warming. They can't control El Nino and La Nina. They can't control the weather pattern systems. They can't control the drought. This planet is running out of time. And it's against that backdrop that, that, that Malachi says, this is the time to proclaim the Elijah's message. How long holds he between two opinions? If God be God, serve him. If God is not God, then serve Baal. If Baal is the true God, serve Baal. If, if Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides, the El Shaddai, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, then we serve him. And, and this is the hour of judgment. So in this Liberty Festival, I am proclaiming the, I am proclaiming the everlasting gospel. The gospel that surrounds a person. The gospel that is about Jesus Christ. The gospel about the cross of Calvary. The gospel that says, what can wash away my sins? Uh, nothing uh, but the blood of Jesus. Uh, what can give me peace within? Nothing uh, but the blood of Jesus. Uh, could I tell you something? There is no man on this planet, no man in this planet who can be happy without God. Am I talking the truth? Folks online, I can hear those in the church, but I can't hear you. But you could shout and I'll imagine you shouting. Those online, no person is happy without God. Can I tell you this? The fountain of happiness is God. And the fountain of holiness is also God. In other words, you can't be unholy and happy. That is, that, that, that is the intrinsics of the gospel. You cannot be unholy and happy. You have to be holy, surrender to God, uh, committed to His Ten Commandments. Uh, you could only be happy when you are serving God. Let's go quickly to the key text for tonight. Malachi 4, 1 to 6. 
For behold, now Malachi, it's very clear. The first verse is telling you, pay attention, the first verse is telling you about the end of the world, about the destruction of the wicked. That, that first verse is telling you that. So let's go. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be what? Stubble. All right, like straw. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, said the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. The fire that will destroy this world will not leave a remnant. There'll be no evidence, all right, of sin. Everything, every casino will be burnt up. Every cemetery will be burnt up. Every gay bar will be burnt up. Every drug den will be burnt up. Every building will be burnt up. Every courthouse will be burnt up. Nothing will be left from this old world. That is what Malachi is saying. And all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that come it shall burn them up, said the Lord of hosts. It shall leave them neither root nor branch. Every tree have mercy. Every shrub, every herb, including the ganja, all of that will be burnt up. And what does verse 2 say? So that Malachi is telling you in the last chapter of Malachi. All right? He's telling you that I'm dealing with the last days. I'm dealing with the conditions of the world before Christ comes. That is what I am dealing with. But unto you that fear the name my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. I don't know about that, but I love that. And he shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. Verse 3. Watch this. And he shall tread down the wicked, and there shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, said the Lord of hosts. So God is saying to Malachi, don't worry the wicked. Their end is sure. They are going to be destroyed. If you don't change, they are going to be destroyed. Don't let them fool you and tie you up and make you feel that, as the Freemasons will make you feel, that at the end of the world, the devil will be in charge and Christ will be his assistant. He'll be the deputy leader. Have mercy. Remember in the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb, uh, for all Israel, with the statutes and judgments. Praise the Lord. Could I tell you something? We are saved by grace, but we are judged by the law. Did, did you get that, Brother Singer? Uh, <laughs> Brother Singer, there is one church that has it clear. We are not saved by obedience to the law. We are saved by grace. Ephesians 2.8, uh, that is the gospel. Are you hearing me, Brother Singer? Righteousness comes from God. Holiness comes from God. Transformation comes from God. Sanctification comes from God. The Latin word is sanctus. Uh, 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 that means to make holy by the power of the ever-living God. That's how we are sanctified. All of that comes from God. We are saved by grace, but we are judged by the law. Because Romans 7 says that the law, the commandment is holy and it's just and it's good. If it came from God, it has got to be holy. Come on. Come on, my dear friends. If it came from God, then it has to be holy. Remember ye the Lord Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him, Horeb, for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Verse 5 says what? Watch at this. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet. So he is saying, he is actually forecasting Revelation 14, 6 and 7. I will send you Elijah the prophet. In other words, I will send you the message. The same message that Elijah preached will be preached in the last days, uh, just before the coming of Christ. Uh, the same message that Elijah preached will be relevant and necessary and imperative uh, before Armageddon. You see, when Armageddon strikes and when the place begins to fall, uh, nobody will be saved after that. Are, are you hearing me, Brother Ringer? Uh, and this is an awesome thought. Uh, you will not be saved. Uh, nobody, the sealing would have finished. Uh, because Armageddon is about those with the seal of God fighting against those with the mark of the beast. Uh, so when the plagues begin to fall uh, and Armageddon comes under the sixth plague, uh, all right, there's nobody to be saved anymore. Everybody would have made their final decision. Uh, and that is when uh, a certain text will not apply. What text is that? In the time of ignorance, God wings. But nobody will be ignorant, all right? Before Armageddon, 
Nobody will be ignorant. He says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. You know, all who are laughing now will not laugh then. All who want the carnival like Belshazzar now wouldn't laugh then. And want any carnival then, they will lose the taste, all right, for the pleasures of the world. They will lose the taste, my dear friends, uh, for the sins and vices of the world, for the drugs, for the prostitution, for the human trafficking. Uh, they will lose the taste, my dear friends, uh, for the pornography. They will lose the taste, my dear friends, uh, for all the vices, uh, the alcohol, uh, the cocaine sniffing, uh, the marijuana bla joint blowing. Uh, they will lose the taste for that when they recognize that they are lost. Lord have mercy. Uh, uh, could you imagine that? You recognize. You know Noah told them 420 years of flood was coming. Genesis chapter 6. And he told them that 420 years. They didn't make one move. And one day the animals came in. The clean one, seven by seven. The unclean, two by two. And at that point in time, that should have told them that a divine hand. You see what the message of Malachi is that in the last days, huh, there will be famine in the land. There will be plagues in the land. But men will have no desire for God. The solution is God, but they will have no desire for the solution because they think they are the solution. Lord have mercy before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Verse 6. Hello, brethren. Could I tell all those online, make it right with God tonight? Because we don't have much longer upon this planet. I am not saying that. The big, the big experts are saying that. We have to get out of here. We have to build space colonies. Uh, that is why they want to get out of here. You know, before Obama exited office, what he said? By 2030, we should be moving people out of this planet. He gave NASA, huh? the aeronautical society, the astrophysicists. He told them, by 2030, we should get ready to move out of here. Now, hold a minute. <laughs> They can't do that. But I know somebody that knows somebody could do it. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now hold a minute here. Malachi is saying that in the last days, you are going to have trouble in the family. You are going to have domestic violence. All what you see going on there, mother, daughter killing mother in St. Mary's there. You will see that. Uh, fathers killing sons. Uh, sons killing both parents, the Melendez children from Mexico. Uh, and, and what he is saying is that the gospel for those who would accept uh, will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children uh, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So Malachi is, is prophesying accurately because now we see, 2,000 years after the prophecy, we are seeing what is going on in this planet. This planet is desperate. Suicide rates, climbing astronomically. Suicide rates, depression, loss of hope. You know, they say when you have hope in a supreme being, and you have four degree burns, you heal faster. When you have hope and trust and faith in a supreme being, your cancer goes into remission faster. Could I make a statement tonight? Faith in God makes a difference. Faith in God makes a difference. They now have this thing called psychoneuroimmunology. Psycho, neuro, Brother Kivon, psychoneuroimmunology. You know what that means? that your thoughts impact upon your immune system. So if you're positive, you're spiritual, and you have faith in God, your immune system functions better than if you're just toxic and you don't want to hear about God. It's a big term. I don't know why I used to talk about psychosomatics in the book Ministry of Healing and Radiant Health, but now the experts are copying her. All right? The same one with the same plagiarizing. They have to copy her. They are saying now they have to change and twist it. The term psychoneuroimmunology. All right? 
And by the way, let me tell you something. Unless you're serving God, your immune system can function. Because faith in God makes a difference in your immune system. Faith in God makes a difference in your heart rate. When you don't have faith in God and stress comes, you suffer from what the cardiologists say, tachycardia. Your heart races, and that's the impact on stress. But I am saying to you, brethren, I thank God for Jesus Christ. He is the great stress reliever. Come on. Somebody say hallelujah. He is the one that puts us at ease. He is the one that puts us in a comfort zone. Uh, even though it was Albert Camus, the famous philosopher. Uh, hold, hold that text right there. But you know what Albert Camus says? He says, in the midst of winter, I have an invincible summer. In the midst of tears, I have an invincible calm. In the midst of confusion, I have invincible confidence. He says that. He says, in the midst of hatred, I have invincible love. That is the power of God. And Camus says in the midst, but couldn't define who was providing the hope, who was providing the invincible summer and the invincible calm and the invincible lover, who was providing that. And I am saying to you, he did not know, but we know it is God and God alone. It is God that provides hope. All of you all over the world watching yesterday, up to when I checked this evening, there were 3,400 people who watched the sermon yesterday. And that's 3,400 devices, uh, not really the amount of people. It could be thousands more than that. Uh, but I am saying uh, that we need a gospel uh, to fear God uh, and give glory to Him uh, for the hour, for the moment, for the time uh, of His judgment has come. Uh, we move on quickly, my dear friends. Uh, uh, prophets speak truth to power. You see Mr. Charles there? <laughs> Lord have mercy. All right, I wouldn't talk about him tonight. But prophets speak truth to power. You think if John the Baptist was alive in England, that he could have married Camilla? Man, he'd have thrown one heavy load of nuclear bomb on him. This one here called himself the king now, King Charles. You understand? Look at him. Like he's ready to fall off the chair already. All right, brethren, he's, he's in pain. Oh, prophets speak truth to power. You have to understand that prophets speak truth to power. Let's run on quickly there. Uh, now, Isaiah, the character of God. Now, remember what Isaiah said. Huh? Yeah. And we are talking about God tonight. That is why when we are persecuted for the gospel's sake and for religion's sake, we have no reason to fear for the future except we forget the God who has led us in the past. Come on, my dear friends. Say amen. Yeah. We have no reason to fear for the future. The eternal God is our refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. As I said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, uh, and his trail was above the temple. I saw the Lord. Look at it. Number one, God is sovereign over nature and the nations. Amen, brethren? God is sovereign. He's large and in charge. No King Charles, no Bill Gates, no Elon Musk, the, the Twitter man. None of them are above God. Huh? God is sovereign over nature and the nations. Number two, God is holy, which is adverse to idolatry and political corruption. Number three, God judges his people and the nations for their sin. That is the almighty God. We run on, we have a few more characteristics, ladies and gentlemen. All right, let's go on to the next slide. Number four, God offers mercy and restoration to those who will turn away from their sin. Listen, brethren, I love that. All right. Not only is he sovereign, not is he, is he holy, not only is he righteous, uh, but the Bible says uh, God keeps his end of the bargain. Uh, that's the message of Malachi. Even when we don't keep our end of the bargain uh, and we abandon God, God does not abandon us. Uh, I say praise God for God. He offers mercy and restoration uh, to those who will turn from their sin. Number five, uh, God's Messiah, the suffering servant, uh, is the one whom his salvation is offered. Through whom his salvation is offered. And number six, God's glory will be proclaimed to all the nations. Brethren, we don't have to know how. But I will tell you, when I check Facebook, all right, yesterday, we could have, what, about 200 people in the church? But in the end, we don't know exactly how many people saw it but 3,400 devices were used. Now, some people watching the big screen at home, that could be six of them or four of them. So in the end, 
the number of people would have watched this message and shared the message could be 10,000. And they came from all over the world. When I sat down in the vestry yesterday, I got two calls. One from Barbados, one from St. Vincent. And then I got another one from Dominica, who watched it in their country. All right? One lady told me, she said, Pastor, I ain't go to church now. I, the lady in Barbados, Rosie Sutton, she said, I stay in right at home, and I take it in five rivers. All right? Like she suffers from five riveritis. All right, but she's staying right there. Are, are you hearing me, Brother Ringer? To hear the word. Now, there are people who don't want to hear the word, but the word is coming to them. That is why, Brother Ringer, I don't criticize the technology. Look, I hear that. Or they could get a couple millions from TTT or wherever. Have mercy. All right, I hope they ain't tricking you all, but listen, they're coming up. Are, are you hearing me, Brother Ringer? Now, now. What you producing is not what Hollywood producing. You know, you have Hollywood, America, Bollywood, <laughs> India, and Nollywood is Nigeria. I'm not joking. You have Bollywood, Nollywood, and Hollywood. But what you are producing, brethren, you are producing through your movies and your drama, the everlasting gospel. I mean, people all over the Caribbean and Latin America watching on what's happening in Five Rivers. And Point is running a distant second. Oh, shocks. Ryan, go kill me for that. They sent the and them. So I wouldn't go there, Pratchinga. But they're running a distant second. But listen, God is an awesome God. And God knows what he is doing. Isn't God an awesome God? Come on. God is an awesome God. And God knows what he is doing. We run on quickly, ladies and gentlemen. You, we can put our trust. There are rulers who defeat themselves. Look at the war between Russia and Ukraine. You know, I study Putin. And I say, look at that. A man who exact, exerting so much power. And he could be totally lost. Perhaps he has committed the unpardonable sin already. I am not God. I don't know that. But there are lots of people who are multi-billionaires, Lord have mercy. And they are lost. They are billionaires, not all, but many of them will go to hell. They will burn in hellfire. And brethren, let not that happen to any of us, online or in the church. Did I hear you say amen, brethren? We must be faithful to God. We must keep our end of the bargain. We must be covenant and truth keepers, not truth breakers. We must be different from the world. We must invite the Holy Ghost to tabernacle in our lives. Uh, let me tell you something, brethren. I'm getting excited right now. Mount Carmel must be resident in our hearts. The experience of Mount Carmel, you know what Elijah did? Uh, Jezebel. And I ate 150 jumbies. Uh, those jumbiacious people. Uh, they broke down the altar of God and put an altar of Baal. And after fire came down from Carmel, you know what happened, brethren? Praise the Lord. Elijah restored Jehovah's altar. And our lives must be a constant swing of restoration of the principles and the values of God in our heart. Come on, somebody say amen. We move on. God is awesome. Oh, Malachi, tell me why. What happened at the Mount Carmel? Huh? Elijah told him they have to make a decision. They have to stop the prostitution. They have to stop the sacrifice of virginity. Tell me why. What happened on Mount Carmel? Why he mentioned Elijah? He mentioned Elijah because there's a message. Elijah has a message. Come straight with God. Uh, surrender to God. Let God be your ruler. Let God take over your heart. God has made a sterling promise in Isaiah 59, 19. Can you read it together, brethren? If your eyes are good like mine, at age 73, can you read it, brethren? So shall they water. Fear. Now, I, those online, you have to read it hard so I can hear you know. So let's start over. One, two, three. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, praise God. The spirit of the Lord shall lift up water, a standard against him. Let me tell you something. <laughs> that what Mary, Queen of Scots says, I fear the prayers of John Knox more than all the armies in Europe. She said prayer was what causes her to tremble. The fear, the, the prayer of a righteous man. What the Bible says, uh, avail it much. Uh, I want to read that text again. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west uh, and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against them. That means uh, if you're in trouble, 
and you're financially bankrupt and you have no job, God will raise up a standard against the devil because it's the devil that has you in that position. And God will transform your condition. God will turn the tide. He can learn the tide and calm the angry sea. That is God. That's why people who say they don't want to get baptized because they will lose their job. You know, and their friends will be against them. They don't know Isaiah 59, 19. That the Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Ghost, the paraclete, the ones who stand by our side, ready to defend us, that Holy Ghost will raise up, have mercy, a standard against them. You, the same Isaiah says, you walk through the fire, God is there with you. You walk through the storm, God is there with you. You walk through the earthquake, God is there with you. God is a consistent God. Uh, are you hearing me, brother? You don't have to second guess. God. You know where God is coming from. He's reliable. All right, Brother Ringer, you can have confidence in God. God will raise up a standard against the enemy, against Satan, against his imps, against his followers. Huh? He wants to destroy you, but God is going to protect you. Hallelujah. We roll on quickly, my dear friends. There was a time of apostasy in Baal worship. First Kings 19, 12, and after the earthquake of fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. This is after Mount Carmel, you know. And after the fire, a still small voice. You know, we are really mortal, you know. Elijah, great prophet of God, got depressed. You know, you know he slaughtered Jezebel's prophets, singer, Kevon. Slaughtered them. And then Elijah says, you kill it. No, Jezebel said, you kill 850, you'll be dead just like them in the morrow. You see, she says, as I live, she defying herself. As I live, and I told you yesterday, she was disappointed. Because she always brought fire. Huh? In a fake sacrificial system, she always brought fire. But the time when fire was the test of the true and living God, she couldn't bring no fire. God paralyzed her fire glands. All right? She couldn't bring no more fire. Isn't God an awesome God? Amen. And Elijah was distressed because Elijah posted a death threat on him. Puffily was tired of, you know, death threats. He was in the endangered species. Uh, hello, when you serve God, you're endangered. But thank God for the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Thank God for the power of the angels. Uh, he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Uh, so they shall bear thee up in the hands, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. Uh, we move on quickly, brethren. Isn't God awesome? Isn't God special? Uh, <laughs> all right, now you, 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 you jump two slides there. Let, let's go back one slide. And after they will pick a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire, it's still small voice. One other verse coming up there. Praise the Lord. Uh, pay attention to where we are going. There's just one more. All right? I, do, I think you have lost me there. Okay, Elijah the prophet used a confrontational approach. His language was one of urgency. He declared that time was running out. They had to make their decision now. And I want to proclaim tonight in this sealing message, I want to proclaim now the time is running out. So the best time to give our hearts to God is now. Did I hear you say amen, brother? The best time to give our hearts uh, and those online... Uh, Come on, hurry up and give your heart to Christ uh, and get baptized. Uh, now is the time uh, to surrender to Jesus Christ. Uh, now is the time to open the word. Uh, now is the time for family worship. Uh, now is the time to lift up your voice uh, like a trumpet uh, and proclaim, uh, fear God uh, and give glory to him uh, for the hour, for the time, uh, for the moment uh, of his judgment is come. Uh, we move on, ladies and gentlemen. God is an awesome God. Uh, and we stay here tonight. Young man in Mark Finley's crusade, a drug addict who could have threatened the entire crusade, all right, in Papua New Guinea. That guy came inside the tent with a desire to destroy. You know, let me tell you something. Only the Holy Ghost could change our appetite, you know. You heard what I just said? Ghost man, only the Holy Ghost could change our appetite. The guy came to destroy <laughs> The crusade. But you know what happened? He ended up by the altar. He gave his heart to Jesus Christ. And the following Sabbath, he got baptized. You know, the same night, the gangsters came and executed him. Decapitated him. 
Four days after, there was a funeral. And the mother was crying. But while she was crying, she was saying, praise God. Praise God. Praise God. You see, she understood when the flood comes, uh, the Holy Ghost would raise up a standard uh, against the devil. So she was crying, but she was saying, praise God. And the preacher called up and said, you're crying, but why, why are you praising God? She says, I am going to miss my son. He's my blood. He came from a womb. Uh, that's where he came from. So I'm going to miss him. Uh, and no mother wants a son to be shot and killed. She says, but I'm glad. Because he gave his heart to Jesus. But saved. Thank God for Jesus Christ. I want to make an appeal to all of us tonight. Let us give our hearts to God. Uh, do you want to make a decision for Christ today? God is calling on you. All of you around the world, here in the everlasting gospel, the gospel, the euangelion that surrounds a person, a unique person, the monogenes, the only one of his kind, a hundred percent God and a hundred percent man. You want to make a decision for Christ today because tomorrow is not promised to us. We could, some of us could be dead in our sleep tonight. And, and so it's not about waiting for Sabbath for the baptism. It's about accepting Christ now in your homes, on the job, wherever you are, all right, accepting Christ right now. People in the Far East are hearing this message. In Africa, in Europe, in Australia, in Russia, they're hearing this message. In Latin America, in California, they're telling, they're hearing the message of the everlasting gospel. Lift up the trumpet and loud let it ring. Jesus is coming again. Cheer up, pilgrims. Be joyful and sing. Jesus is coming again. I want to use the singer tonight to sing one verse, all to Jesus, I surrender. Let's all stand for the prayer. Hallelujah. God is awesome. It is 24 minutes past eight. And you want to surrender all to Jesus tonight. We have no meeting tomorrow night. No meeting tomorrow night. But we have on Tuesday night. Praise God for his blessing. Praise God for his blood. The blood that will never lose his power. Uh, you could go ahead, brother. All to Jesus, Let's all sing. I Online, you can sing to. All to Him I freely give. Hallelujah. I will we would ever love and trust Him. Love if you love God, raise your hand. If you want to go to heaven when He comes. All of you online, in this intercontinental audience and congregation, surrender all to Jesus tonight. Give your heart to God tonight. Lean on the everlasting arms tonight. Remember the baptism on Sabbath coming. Give your heart to God tonight. You wish to be baptized? Send a message online. And let us know you're surrendering all to Jesus. And so until Tuesday night, have faith in God. Jesus is your best friend. Have faith in God. He will love you till the end. Have faith in God. He saved us by his grace. Have faith, dear friends. One day we shall see him face to face. In the name of the Father, name of the Son, Name of the Holy Ghost that everybody here say.